So Shakespeare's Macbeth. I wonder sometimes if this is the play that is most frequently taught. Probably it's Hamlet. Probably it's Hamlet, right? But it seems like everybody reads Macbeth in high school. My students all show up having read Macbeth. It's very popular. I understand why. Um, it's weird. You got witches, you got ghosts, you got murder, regicide. There's interesting gender stuff going on with, with Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. But the thing is, my sense is this, that uh, most people get Macbeth wrong. Or at least there is, there is a dimension to the play that most people miss. So we're gonna talk about that. But most people I think are kind of wrong about Macbeth because they focus too much on the evil. Macbeth seems like this, this abnormal, monstrous, tyrannical evildoer. And I think he probably is that, but also this is where it gets complicated. He might not be that different from everybody else in the play. I wanna do a surface reading of Macbeth see what the play seems to be about. And then I want to suggest if we look a little more closely, the play actually seems to contradict that that superficial or that surface reading. So at the beginning of the play, King of Scotland, Duncan is, is threatened by rebels, but his forces, really led by Macbeth, are able to, to repel this insurrection. But after the battle, Macbeth meets some witches, right? And they, they issue some prophecies. One, that Macbeth is going to become Thane of Cawdor, and also that he will be king. Now, initially, Macbeth thinks this is, you know, this is all just baloney, until he's immediately promoted to Thane of Cawdor, and then he starts thinking, right? The gears start turning. Uh, so first they said I was going to be Thane of Cawdor, and then they said I was going to be king. So Macbeth then has this, this new ambition. The king is going to stay at his house. He's going to get it into his head, with the help of his wife, to murder his king. Macbeth, right, in this moment, and, and it's, it's powerfully dramatized in the play, seems to be wicked. He conforms to uh, an early modern or a Renaissance uh, portrait, a definition of a bad guy, basically, right? He, he is a, a traitor, a murderer. Uh, he, he kills his king in order to, to satisfy his own ambition. Just like straightforwardly a bad dude. And on top of that, He's taken the advice of witches. So he's got he's got this this witchcraft association too. And his wife, who who also seems to be ambitious and is really counseling him to do the the evil deed, she seems pretty creepy too. So at the beginning of the play, early on, we're given this this portrait in the in the opening action of this man who is a valiant warrior who succumbs to temptation, who is overwhelmed by ambition, who is seduced by the supernatural, all bad signs, right? So we, it's, it seems very straightforward, right? What we're getting is a representation of ambition and temptation, a very moral tale. Here is a man who was loyal to his king who has become disloyal. And early in the play, Macbeth is represented as the picture of loyalty. Duncan praises him for his service and Macbeth responds, the service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state. Macbeth is this, this image of the, the loyal soldier, and then he falls. He falls hard. So to understand this a bit better, let me give you a bit of, a bit of context, okay? So how would Shakespeare and, and his contemporaries have understood this, this act of murder, this act of regicide? Conventionally, in the period, in Shakespeare's England, the king or monarch was thought to have been placed on the throne by God. Not everybody thought that, not everybody believed it, but that was the orthodox conventional understanding. This is the divine right of kings. And because the universe, because the natural world is created by God, it also was, was generally believed, or at least monarchs liked to argue this, that their authority, their power, was rooted in nature, in natural law as well. It was also understood that that nature had patterns, right? And we think that too, except the patterns in, in early modern thought were probably more strict. So there was this general sense that the family had a particular structure, right? A patriarchal structure, and the church should have that structure, and the political community should also have that structure. 
the king or the monarch was like a father and the people living in the country were like a family. King James, for example, makes in his political writings, makes these arguments explicitly. So he, you know, he believed this. This was the, the way of thinking about monarchical power, that it was like paternal or, or parental power. You may have also heard of the metaphor of the body politic. There was also this, this general conception that uh, a state could be understood to be like a body. A country was kind of like a body and every person who lived in the country was sort of like a part of the body. And this was a way of thinking about the way in which, which people are interconnected, right? It's kind of a useful metaphor in that it, it illustrates that everybody who lives here is part of one greater whole and harm done to any one part of the body uh, extends to is felt by the rest of the body. But it's also a bit of a self-serving metaphor for those in power because the king is the head of the body and could represent himself as the most essential part of the body. And that to, to assault the head, to attack the head would be suicidal. But good to keep in mind, in real terms, uh, removing, deposing, assassinating a king is not actually like uh, taking off your own head. Maybe you could find another head, maybe a better head, right? That is something that could be true. So generally speaking, when Macbeth kills the king, he's decapitating the Scottish body politic. He is murdering his own father. It is an assault on the will of God. All of those things might be running through the head of someone sitting in, in one of Shakespeare's audiences. Maybe running through Shakespeare's own head. I'm skeptical, but maybe. This, this is the way that I think Macbeth is most often interpreted. He is a traitor, he is unnatural, he is a criminal, kind of a criminal against God. He, he strikes against the laws of God and the laws of nature, whole thing, bad dude. And this reading has much to recommend it because once Macbeth becomes king, once he becomes the monarch, he's a tyrant. He, he becomes violent, uh, murders his friends, murders children. He, he becomes a terrible tyrant and he's called a tyrant in the play. So he seems to be a man who succumbs to temptation, overcome by ambition, does a terrible thing, commits a terrible crime, a sin, and then is tormented both in the world and, and maybe by his conscience, right? His wife is tormented. And then as the play concludes, right, we get this, this alliance between the noble Scottish who, are, who oppose Macbeth and some very Christian God-fearing English. They align with each other, they overthrow Macbeth and order is restored to the world and the universe. So it seems, in a way, what the play shows us is this deviation from the natural order when Duncan is killed and Macbeth ascends to power, he becomes a tyrant, and then he is killed and then order is restored, right? So the natural order uh, is revealed to be durable, is, is revealed to be reliable, there are deviations from it because of human crime, human criminality, human sinfulness, but order can be restored or not. What I wanna to do to really understand Macbeth, I think we wanna go back to the beginning. You should always pay super close attention to the beginning of Shakespeare's plays. The beginnings, a lot is contained in the beginnings. This is just good reading advice generally. Every time you're reading something, pay, pay super close attention to the beginning. How do things begin? So a couple of things, the very first scene of Macbeth, the play begins with the witches, right? With the weird sisters and begins in kind of a weird way. When shall we three meet again? So we almost begin kind of in medias res, right? This meeting and this gesturing towards when it's going to, when it's going to happen again. And at the end of this little encounter, there's this very famous line, Fair is foul and foul is fair. Fair is foul and foul is fair. The thing I think we wanna, wanna hold on to with that line is this sense of, of repetition, circularity, and inversion. Things that are fair are actually foul. Things that are foul are actually fair. So there's this, this sense right off the bat from the witches, things are not what they seem. Things that are fair are foul. Things that are foul are fair. So right off the bat, there's this sense of inversion, right? <laughs> we need to track this as we go through the play, right? Because is it, okay, so does that mean, is that just a, a an anticipation that Macbeth who seems fair is actually foul? Or is it that things that seem foul are actually fair? Uh, the first indication of this, this thing we need to think about is this conflict which begins the play. We've gotta pay super close attention to the details here because at the start of this play, Duncan is in a lot of trouble. We first hear about Macbeth fighting McDonald. McDonald is described the merciless McDonald worthy to be a rebel 
For to that, the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. So there, again, we get this nature thing, right? Like MacDonald, because he is a rebel, is unnatural. The villainies of nature swarm upon him. And he's supplied, it says, he's he's reinforced, he's supported by troops from the Western Isles, so probably Ireland. So you've got MacDonald, who's a rebel, who's supplied by the Irish, okay? So that's one conflict. Macbeth kills that guy. Right? In a gruesome way. Like, cuts him in half from, like, belly up. <laughs> Yikes. So, Macbeth defeats him. But then, but then, we hear about the king of Norway, who, seeing an opportunity, seeing that, you know, the Scottish divided or, or the Scottish in trouble, thinks that, uh, I might have an opportunity here. So, Norway invades. And he's supported by a traitor the Thane of Cawdor. Now Macbeth also meets that adversary and defeats him as well. Though the Thane of Cawdor survives, but is captured and Duncan sentences him to death. These details really, really matter. We need to think through these particular details. At the beginning of the play, Duncan is fighting enemies on multiple fronts. There's a rebellion, there's a traitor, Norway is coming, the Irish are coming, and his own people are rising up against him. Is Duncan a good king? That's a real question at the beginning of this play. And this, I, I don't think in any sense this this means that like Macbeth is some kind of liberator or, or he's a patriot or something like that. It, that's not the representation we get. Macbeth is ambitious, right? He just wants to rule. But he is not, this is critical, he is not abnormal. Macbeth, by the time he revolts, against against Duncan. He's the third guy in the first act to undertake this enterprise. So it's it's curious, right? We get this this representation that Macbeth we're hyper focused on Macbeth's like moral anguish as he wrestles with whether or not he should do this thing. And we kind of forget that Macbeth is typical. Macbeth is typical. How does that change how we read this play? We might want to think about, like, is there some systemic problem in Scotland that this keeps happening? Or, at a minimum, is Duncan a good king? I don't know. A lot of people want to kill him. We also need to rethink the supernatural a bit in this play. So, on the one hand, this is, this is a very magical play. There's witches, there's ghosts, visions, prophecies. Uh, there's a Christ-like king who can heal by touching people. A lot of hocus pocus. But at the same time, there is, I think, this this kind of interrogation of the supernatural going on, or or maybe about how does the supernatural manifest itself in the world. That might be a better way to think about it. So we talked about the divine right of kings, right? So there's this sense that that the king and the body of the king, the person of the king, is somehow invested with with a quasi divine power. Maybe not even quasi, maybe just divine power. But Duncan's death and the way he dies, how easily he dies, actually, I think calls some of this into question, puts some pressure on the idea of, of the divine right of kings or the divinity of monarchy. The men guarding him get drunk. Duncan falls asleep. We're, we very much get this, this picture of the limitations of the physical body and Macbeth is able to slip into his room and murder him because he's an old man asleep in his bed. So it, it really, you know, juxtaposed to this idea of this, you know, that that Macbeth has like assaulted God, right, by by murdering Duncan. So there's this great disparity in a way between the the mythology um, around monarchy in the period and in the play and the way that Duncan very easily is murdered. And there might be something very subversive going on, right? Because Shakespeare might be suggesting to us that all the majesty, all the pomp and circumstance around, around the divinity of monarchy might just be pageantry. It might just be uh, theater. Maybe it's not real. What is the nature of, of the crime, right? Is it, is it a cosmic crime? Or is it a human crime? You know, is Macbeth this this unnatural monster, this this singular force of evil in the universe, and he needs to be killed in order to restore the cosmic order? Or is this a representation of a much more ordinary form of political evil, human evil? Macbeth is just doing what other people tried to do earlier in the play. Which is not to say that it's good or that that excuses his behavior. It is evil. He does really become a tyrant and do bad things. But what is the nature of evil, 
right? What is the nature of evil? Like if we understand evildoers, if we think of evildoers as as extraordinary, you know, people who do out of the ordinary things, does that make it harder for us to actually grapple with the ordinariness, the commonality of evil? How special is Macbeth and how ordinary is Macbeth? And this, I, I think this whole murder calls into question the divine right of kings. I think it's kind of deflating for, for all of this, this kind of mythological architecture around what it means to be a king. To be God's agent on earth, oh, well, we'll just get your guards drunk and we'll kill you in your sleep. Like, you know, it's that easy. In what sense are you God's agent on earth then? So I think when you're reading Shakespeare, it's, it's really important. We have this tendency sometimes to, to think, well, Shakespeare thought. Or uh, we, we might say, oh, well, you know, people at the time all believed this. So Shakespeare thought this too, right? So, uh, you know, because people thought that a uh, king was placed on the throne by God, that's what Shakespeare thought. Maybe Shakespeare didn't think that. In fact, it's also an overly simplification to say, you know, people thought that. Oh, everybody thought like this. Well, does everybody think the same way now? No. So everybody didn't think the same way then either, right? People have different opinions, different ideas. There are subversive and countercultural people. There are people who think the dominant orthodox positions that society holds are wrong and stupid. The same was true in Shakespeare's day. Shakespeare might have been one of those people, or maybe not. Like maybe he holds many of these, these positions, but we don't know. And we need to bring that uncertainty to our interpretation of the plays. We can't just lazily assume that, oh, well, Shake you know, people at the time thought this, so Shakespeare thought this too. So that's what the play's about, right? The play's about, you know, how killing a king is an assault against God, maybe. Or maybe it's about how all the pageantry and mythology that surrounds monarchy does not actually make regimes and states secure. It does not guarantee a king's success or protection or legitimacy. Just saying that you're God's agent on earth does not necessarily make you legitimate. This is actually the problem that Macbeth runs into in the latter part of the play. Because by killing Duncan, Macbeth has introduced this, this kind of like paradox, I think, that he wrestles with. Because, you know, he's demonstrated to himself that being a king offers you no protection. Being a king does not grant you some kind of you know, divine armor that protects you against assaults from treacherous citizens or subjects. You're not safe, right? He's demonstrated how easily all of this, this, this mythological architecture could just be torn down. And so Macbeth, precisely now that he's king, he needs that mythological architecture. He needs that, that protection, that belief system to believe that, no, actually I'm, I'm here because of supernatural forces, right? They have brought me to this place, right? The witch's prophecies. I am I'm shielded by the supernatural. That's what he wants to believe, but he knows that that's not true. Early in the play, he recognizes this is gonna happen. Act one, scene seven. He's thinking this is, you know, if it were done, when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly, right? He's, he's trying to psych himself into this. And he recognizes, like he follows through the implications of his action. He says, but in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instructions which being taught, return to plague the inventor. By killing Duncan, aren't I setting an example, a precedent, right? That if you're unhappy, if you want to be king, you can just murder the king. That he's he's setting that precedent and he knows that. And so after he becomes king, he, he feels this deep desire to achieve security and certainty. And that's why, precisely because he knows he's not shielded by divinity, he turns towards tyranny. He uses, he uses tyrannical methods to achieve security. So then think about the end of the play. Right? And think about the ending again and what it might mean. Because you know, initially we thought, okay, this is about the restoration of the natural order. Justice is restored to the universe with Macbeth's assassination. But it's not quite that easy, right? Because think about the way Macbeth is killed. You know, at the end he's he's called like a hellhound and stuff, all, all these these epithets that suggest his his unnatural character. But at the end of the play. Macduff shows up carrying Macbeth's head. Think about that body politic image, right? The head has been taken off the body. Think this through. Think of that, that opening act of violence at the beginning of the play. This guy chopped in half. And then at the end of the play, okay, so there's another rebellion and then somebody's head's chopped off. Fair is foul, foul is fair. Things that seem fair are foul. Is this, this ending with, with Macbeth's murder are we to feel good about this? Is Scotland saved? Or is this just the most recent in a long line of insurrections, 
rebellions, violent murders, right? We started with, with McDonald, with the King of Norway, Thane Cawdor, then Macbeth, now Macduff. Yes, Macbeth seemed to have been a tyrant, but by deposing him, do we have any confidence that, that things are gonna be good now? Or was Macbeth just one instance in a whole sequence of violent insurrections? Is politics governed by God's justice? Can we count on, on divine justice to like steer politics in the right way and restore the natural order? Is that something we can have confidence in? Or is politics just this, this unending sequence of ambition and criminality and violence? That's dark. I think the play opens itself up to, to multiple readings, right? That's why we keep returning to it. That's why we keep returning to Shakespeare all the time. Because he has this way of writing where it can seem like we're getting one thing and then the other thing. There are probably a million ways to read this play. That's just the way I read it. Hey, I'm Dr. Moore. I teach great books at St. Thomas University. And on YouTube, I make videos about great books like Macbeth. If you want to watch another one of those, you can find one over here.